Hi there, I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Sebastian Richard. And we're so happy, we're psyched actually, that you could join us for this webinar, seminar, masterclass that we're gonna be giving that we called Poverty is No Virtue. And as we go, you're gonna, as we keep delving into the subject, you're gonna understand why we called it Poverty is No Virtue. Yeah, yeah and go ahead, Liz. with the, the times that we're living right now, you know, with the virus and uh, how it's affected, you know, our economy, and um, we just felt that the Lord was really talking to us to uh, do this masterclass to really open people's eyes, uh, especially believers that, uh, you know, may have more of a, a poverty mindset, are, are kind of scared of, you know, creating wealth. And we really wanted to do this so that you can see what God says about your ability to create wealth and what God thinks of poverty and prosperity. And so this is really going to be an eye opener. It's really going to bless you and it's going to really help you towards financial freedom. Yeah, because that's what we want for you. We want this. I mean, God wants his servants, his children to be prosperous. And I know uh, for a lot of you, maybe you're coming from a background where you're like, wait a minute, that's not what my pastor taught me. My pastor taught me that, that, uh, uh, riches will corrupt me, that riches are, are not of, they are of this world, and I have to shun the things of this world. But we're going to teach you through this webinar a biblical view of money that is healthy, that is sound, and that is actually going to bless you in becoming more to uh, um, have more so that you can give more. And that's, I think, the whole outlook that a Christian should have about money. And too many times, like Elizabeth said, we have a, the wrong mindset about money. Yeah, so... Without delaying, we're going to share a screen so that we can start this webinar, this masterclass. From current slide. And boom, there we go. We are in. So, Poverty is No Virtue masterclass. So, here's what you're going to learn today by sticking around till the end. And we hope you stick around till the end, okay? Because this is really, really solid content we're about to deliver here. It's going to have a tremendous amount of value to you. And it can potentially, and I'm serious about this, change your life. Really, it can. So you will learn how to stop self-sabotaging your success. And you're going to prosper God's way. You're going to learn how to prosper God's way in just over an hour. We're hoping it, it won't go over an hour and a half. But it's worth it. Stick around. You'll see at the end how much it's worth it. We're going to give you some great stuff. So before we get started, Liz, there's a few questions we wanted to ask our audience. What are the few questions? So how would it feel if the Bible promises you read fit the life you led? How would it feel to know for sure that God actually wills your prosperity? How would it feel to find out, finally stop self-sabotaging your own success and experience explosive spiritual and financial blessings in your life? So the, th the thing is, the theme that you can see is, how would it feel? Like, think about it. If you're stuck financially and you read the Bible and promises, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, they're telling you that God uh, we'll wants you to have more than enough. God uh, will provide all good things for you. God, you're his child and he, he wants to give you good things. When you read this and, and you look at, if you look at your bank account and you're broke and you're having trouble paying the rent or paying uh, anything that you need, food, anything, you kind of, what the devil does is he's going to get you to question God's word. God's goodness. Or, yeah. or you may maybe just start questioning like if what you believe is actually true. So this is a very dangerous and slippery slope. And we know that God's promises are true. And we know that they are true for you as well. And we're going to show you this in this webinar. So an official welcome. Uh, like I said earlier, stay until the end because we have free offers to help you thrive. Our goal with this webinar masterclass is to open your eyes to what's possible by understanding God's kingdom plan when it comes to your finances. Lack of finances and a poor mindset concerning money has ailed believers for long enough. And that's why we're doing this class. We want believers to take back territory, to claim back what is theirs by promise, by what God says. It's, it's, based, it's in your account. It's in heaven's vault. But the problem is most believers do not dare to claim it, do not believe it's there. Uh, they, they believe false theology about money and they remain stuck. So before we begin, 
we, you probably don't know much about us. We, call, we, we told you who we are. I'm Sebastian Richard. She's Elizabeth Richard. But who are we really? So let's just... Yeah, so we're just going to explain to you a little bit about us. So and here's a little do. bit. Yeah, here's a little bit about who we are and what we do. So we're certified coaches and leadership trainers. We're the founders of Thriving on Purpose, and we host the Thriving on Purpose podcast, which you can find on Google Play, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, all the podcast platforms. So we help today's believers to grow in kingdom knowledge, life, and leadership. So we talk about all kinds of um, topics that really help the believer to thrive uh, today as a kingdom believer. So Sebastian is an author and Bible teacher. He wrote Lead Like a Superhero and Thrive on Purpose and other books. Uh, we both have been studying the Word of God for years and have been mentored by many great leaders in the fields of faith, personal growth, and leadership. So, so that's who we are. And now, now we're going to delve with the good stuff. The good stuff is our story because uh, here's the thing. We, we didn't always believe what we believe today about money, but we're just going put, to put you in context where we're coming from because uh, you, you're going to identify what, what our story because uh, back in 2012, which is a while back, uh, my wife and I, we were both working for Canada Post, a big uh, company here in Canada that is basically the, like the, post equivalent of the post office, the equivalent of the U.S. mail for those of you in America. But... Uh, we were working very hard, long hours, and shifts that really uh, were difficult. And uh, we, we never saw each other, right, Liz? I mean, yeah. So was, our schedules were basically, um, you know, one of us was always working on seven days. So there was never one day where we both were together as a couple. And uh, at that time, we had our son. I was pregnant with our 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 daughter, and we just thought, you know, this is a crazy way to live life. Um, yes, the pay is decent, the pay is, the pay is good, but is it really worth sacrificing our family? There's never going to be one day when we actually can be off together and have a nice time together or even go apple picking or do whatever our families do because we're always working. So we felt like we had bought into this way of life thinking, well, that's just life. So maybe some of you identify with that, you know, you're, you have these long hours, you never see your kids, never see uh, your wife, and you're just always working, working, working. You seem that it seems that your life... All it is about is working and paying bills, working, paying bills, working, paying bills. Well, it seemed to us that this didn't make any sense for us as believers. Uh, we knew something was amiss and we just we couldn't put our finger on it, but we were tired and really frustrated. So we were sick and tired of being sick and tired, as you can read from that slide. We were both sick and tired of being broke, we always had more month at the end of our money. We were sick and tired of being slaves to crazy work schedules. And, and to give you an idea, uh, I worked evenings. So I started at 3 p.m. and finished at 11.30. Was it this? 3.30. Mm -hmm. uh, 3.30 to 11.30. That was my shift um, because I didn't have this, enough seniority to be on a day shift. Uh, and we had unreasonable bosses. I mean, the, 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 the mindset of the company over there was not, it was just not healthy. And uh, we were doing basically a job we both hated. Liz was doing it on weekends. And what was your shift, Liz, on weekends? Yeah, so I worked some of the days during the week um, when times were very busy. And then the, I had to work all of the weekends. So Saturday and Sunday, uh, without a doubt, I had to work those full days. And part, eight of, hours. part of a night shift also on the, on the weekends, huh? Yeah, sometimes I did night shift as well. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, we, we thought it would be best to do it this way because I was on a part-time shift, so I had more time with my son, but at the same time, he was never there. So anyway, we don't want to get into the details of that. Yeah, but, but we were feeling trapped. And, and here's the thing, uh, feeling trapped, why were we feeling trapped? Very simple. We had this job, this government job, quote unquote government job that paid good wages, that had benefits. We had some good benefits. And as a result, with our education, uh, I had a, a high school diploma. I have done some university, but I never completed it. So I, all I had was a high school diploma. And I felt like, you know what, Seb, this is pretty much as good as it's going to get. And Elizabeth was in the same, um, same situation. She thought the same way. We had that mindset that this is as good as it's going to get for us. And we were also sick and tired of commuting, which was another problem, but in, in 
when you, we lived around Montreal at the time and Montreal, Quebec. And yeah, three hours of commuting a day was uh, pretty crazy. Well, exactly. And we were working evening shifts to avoid the commute. And we knew that if we went a day shift, we'd have a crazy commute that would be too long. So we got to a point where we began discussing, is there any way we can change our situation? And with the mindset we had at the time, the idea we had was, we have to find a way to cut expenses. We have to cut expenses. Because we, we weren't in a mindset where we were thinking abundance. We were in a mindset where we were, this is how much we have. It's not gonna grow. This is it. So what can we cut to make sure we live better? And the two options we came up with was either to downsize, so sell our house and move into maybe a, a cardboard box or a mobile home or something of the something where we would not have been at ease or another option canada is a big country canada post is a big company and it's all across canada we thought what if we move to another province where perhaps the house prices are lower so we began thinking about what our options were and here's what we decided so like i said we were deciding are we going to downsize or move well we thought the houses are not expensive on Prince Edward Island. We looked at that and we decided we we're going to do both. We're downsizing and, and moving. moving. <laughs> so we were, we, we applied at, we were in Montreal. We applied to move either to New Brunswick or Prince Edward Island, whichever place called us first. And lo and behold, Prince Edward, uh, Prince Edward Island came calling after, and after prayer, it was an answer to prayer. And that was a huge thing for us. We, we really needed to feel that God was guiding us to, yeah. for, through this move. So we moved 12 hours away from our family, our friends. We knew absolutely nobody in nobody. Prince Edward Island. Nobody. And we had never been. How crazy is that? We had never been to Prince Edward Island. The only thing we had seen were videos on YouTube of the island and some maybe yeah. a couple of short documentaries. Yeah. So we just prayed about it and we just had asked God to open doors. Uh, I wanted to be a stay at home mom. I want to be with my children. I want to have a family life. Uh, you know, I knew that that was the godly thing for me to do mm -hmm. at the time. And he wanted to be with his family. And so it was a no brainer, you know, let's move downsize, try to have, um, you know, an option where I don't have to work yeah. so that we can pull this off. Right? And, and uh, we, so we moved. Yeah. Well, you kind of change the slide a bit too. <laughs> we didn't want you to see that, but so we moved and we made the transition. It was a big move, like a huge logistics, very complicated, but uh, we did it. And uh, so I began working as a mail carrier. I was daytime. Yay. We we're happy because I was daytime. Uh, I hated my job even more as a mail carrier than when I was working inside the building as a mail sorter. But anyway, and I was, I was getting very depressed. And Elizabeth was doing the stay at home mom thing. Uh, we were trying to enjoy our lives as a family, but I was seeing, because I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who administrates our, our budget. And I was seeing uh, all <laughs> my pipe dream <laughs> was just, not working because I was seeing the bank again going. Mm. Yeah. So we realized that my salary was really hitting hard. The fact that it was missing Yeah, and um, that, you know, things were better in, in many ways, but you know, we were kind of questioning, you know, um, the Lord opened doors for us to move here. Um, but at the same time, we weren't making it financially because even if the mortgage rates were lower, uh, being on an island, there were other hidden costs that were a lot more that we didn't expect. So just a year later, this is exactly what we looked like. We were broke. Yeah. We were indebted. And I was, I was the, the first one, obviously, as the, as the administrator, I was the first one to have his dream broken uh, because I was really dreaming of the, I don't know, the perfect biblical family life with the stay at home wife who's staying with the kids and, and, and the daddy who goes to work in the daytime and comes back and, and all that came crashing really, really badly. A year later, I was depressed. I came to Liz. I said, Liz, it is not working. She says, what's well, not working? And yeah, I was like, so well, our lives, our cost, move, everything we did in the last year, it's yeah. not working. So we realized that, you know, the cost of living and everything that's quite expensive everywhere catches up with you really quick, no matter where you move to. 
And so that was just not going to be an option to cut and cut and cut. We had cut everything possible and um, we were still not making it financially. We so something had to change. Something had to change. So we did the unthinkable. And when I say the unthinkable is, I don't know if, if you're like me, but coming from a, a very Baptist background, praying for money is something you don't really do. Like you don't really pray for money. So for me to be brought to my knees, practically begging God for money or for a way out or for a way in or for something to work, uh, I was brought to my knees. And, uh, and together, we, we, I, we, after a long discussion, we said, okay, so let's get on our knees and let's ask God to give us money, the money we need to make it or something like that. So God's answer, God's answer. And it didn't come the way I thought it would come. See, I, I, I had the, uh, back then I thought, I heard all these stories about missionaries and, and Christians who were at the end of their rope financially would pray and magically a check would show up or, or a relative would call and say, God put on my heart to give you $25,000. I don't know why, here's the money. I thought it would come like this. And lo and behold, it did not. And I was really distraught because I kept my debts, my debts kept growing. My situation kept getting worse and worse. And still I was kind of like desperate for that magic mailbox thing that would, that would show up. And Liz kept telling me that's not how God works. God's not going to do that. And maybe she was <laughs> cursing us by saying that. <laughs> but, but at the time I was hoping for something positive and it didn't, it didn't come out. Instead, as you can see the little, school graduation hat there, God was going to school us, starting with me, in the area of finances through many, many different ways, but one of which was going to be, of course, uh, his word, but I'll get into that later. But one of the ways he, he picked to get, uh, to, to get the thing started was that I one day went to a bookstore. I mean, I'm an author, I'm a writer, I love to read. So I, it's not uncommon for me to go to a bookstore to just browse for fun. But on that particular day, I was not going to the particular, the particular sections that I'm used to going to. Um, when I go to a bookstore, oftentimes I go, oh, I go to uh, sections that have to do with uh, spirituality and Christianity. And uh, so for, for that particular day, I went to the finance section. I was like, I wonder if I can find something in the financial section. And a book caught my attention, but it was more than just catching my attention. I felt drawn to that book. It's like the book pulled me. And then I pulled it out of the shelf and I read, it was Think and Grow Rich. So by Napoleon Hill, a classic on finances and how to acquire wealth. And as a believer, trust me, where I came from, that was not the type of book that I would have been drawn to normally. But for some reason, I read the back cover and I was like, I gotta buy that book. I knew that God was telling me to buy that book. I came home, I told Liz, I said, Liz, I bought a book today. God told me to buy it. I told her my story and I took it out of the bag and said, think and grow rich. I need to read this. I need to read this. God pulled me towards that book. And that was only the beginning. Right, Liz? Right. Remember that day? Anything to add there? Yeah. So that was quite special because our eyes were starting to open to, you know, there's more to this. Now, obviously the book is not a Christian book, but the, there's a lot of, principles and uh, different things that uh, we read that are based on laws that God did apply, um, that God did create for uh, man, basically, whether you're Christian or non-Christian. And we started seeing, okay, you know, there's a, there's a bigger, there's more to this than we thought, you know, we, a lot we, more. we, we were just, you know, discovering the tip of this. And that was the tip of the iceberg. So, and I like that Elizabeth mentioned the book was not a Christian book because when you decide to go on a quest to find out what God uh, intends or says about money, you basically kind of need to start shifting your, your thinking. And it, he reminded me of a quote. As I was reading that book and finding uh, things that had, were basically contrary to a lot of the stuff I had been taught. But the problem is a lot of the stuff I had been taught was from broke people, pastors mm -hmm. who had no money. And, and I was thinking that and taking it to the bank and saying, I'm going to be like that too, because they're godly. Well, 
God started shifting my thinking. He says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And it's the same, that principle is universal. Anything, it applies to anything, including the word of God, the Bible. And I began to change the way I was reading or understanding the Bible and the area of finances. And God also re reminded me at the time to be teachable. Aristotle, very respected man, a philosopher, said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought right. without accepting it. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So in order for me to start mind shifting and for Elizabeth to start mind shifting, we needed to think thoughts we had never thought before. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to entertain that thought for at least a brief moment, thinking, what if? Albert Einstein, another very smart guy, said, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. And unfortunately, many evangelicals like we were, many Christians, we tend to condemn without investigation. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is, our understanding of the Bible. Now notice I'm not saying the Bible or what the Bible says. Our understanding of the Bible. When we hear something that seems to contradict it, we tend to have the knee-jerk reaction right away to reject it and say, oh, ho, 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 that is not of God. I am not going there. I am not touching that with a 10-foot pole. And here's the thing. When we hear new things, it is wise to at least, if it, if there is some sense to it, if it is not con like, if it's not like basically saying worship Satan, obviously, you know, you need to reject that. But if it's something that may be investigate, and that's what Albert Einstein is saying. And unfortunately, most believers, most, we call ourselves believers, but what do we believe really? <laughs> most Christians have a negative belief. I have more than one negative beliefs about money. Uh, and I like that image. It kind of shows that Christians are kind of like, uh, kind of have a phobia against money. Like, I, don't, I can't have too much of that because that's of the devil. And I know that if I have too much of that, I'm going to become like the devil. So don't, don't give me too much, Lord, just enough to pay the bills. And that's it. And I'm, I'm going to stay godly that way because, hey, I won't have too much and therefore become corrupt. So let's start with those negative beliefs about money. Number one, Money is the root of all evil. Have you ever heard that? And I know for some of you who are well read in the Bible, you know that is not the actual quote. Okay, and we're going to get to that. But have you ever, ever heard that people say that money is the root of all evil? And a lot of us are taught by our parents and our grandparents, especially if they're broke. Strangely enough, right? You never hear rich people say that. But broke people say that. Broke people say that. Why? To justify their way of life. Mm -hmm. They're broke. It doesn't make any sense to them. So how am I going to justify that I'm broke and I have a hard time providing for my kids? Well, money is the root of all evil. And therefore, by being broke, I'm a good person. Yes, I am. That's how we think, right? Next slide. The actual quote, for, for those of you who are well-read in the scriptures, you know that it is the love of money, the love of money, that is the root, a root of all kinds of evil in its first Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The love of money. So there's a huge difference between saying that money is the root of all evil and the love of money that is the root of all evil. See, money has nothing to do with it. When you think about it, it's the uh, obsession of the person that makes it evil. Their obsession is acquiring, because what happens when you love money? What happens when you love money? You want more of it, right? What happens when you love cake? See, and you want more of it. Th this is a, a huge problem is that most Christians don't understand the kind of mindset that God wants them to have towards money and how active we're supposed to be in the kingdom and that we actually need this current currency to uh, accomplish more for God here on earth, to get the gospel out and to do all kinds of good works that help the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So when you understand the bigger picture, and we're going to talk about that later in the webinar, then you don't love money because you understand it's just a currency that a you tool. need. It's a tool that you need 
to uh, accomplish God's work. So your focus changes to what you want to accomplish for God's works and not hoarding money and loving money and, and looking at your bank account go up and, and becoming so focused on just your gains because that's not a godly mindset. That's not the, the mindset that God wants us to have towards money. And speaking of the love of money, we're going to bring, I think it's the next slide, Liz, a case study. I want to bring up a case study of what the love of money actually does and what, so basically the, the two people you see on your screen, Hedy Green right. and RJ Letourneau, RJ Letourneau, uh, both of these people had lots of money, okay? But they didn't have the same mindset when it came to money. So first of all, we're going to talk about Hetty Green because you probably don't know her. She was also known as the Witch of Wall Street. Look at this beautiful woman. Uh, I'm being mean here. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. That's not very nice of me. But so she was an American businesswoman and finance, financier known as the richest woman in America at the time during the, her, the time she was on earth. She was known for her wealth and was named by the Guinness Book of World Records, the greatest miser ever. So her thriftiness says here, that's from Wikipedia, her thriftiness, or they should say her cheapness was legendary. She was said never to turn on the heat or use hot water. She wore one old black dress and undergarments that she changed only after they had been worn out. She did not wash her hands and she rode in an old carriage. She ate mostly pies that cost 15 cents. One tale even claims that Green, Hetty Green, spent half a night searching her carriage for a lost stamp that was worth two cents. Another tale asserts that she instructed her uh, laundress to wash only the dirtiest parts of her dresses, the hems of her dresses, to save money on soap. And it says that, and they, they call it her frugality, I think it's polite, her cheapness. <laughs> Was there a word for cheapness? Anyway, it extended to her family life. It says that when her son Ned broke his leg as a child, Hetty tried to have him admitted to a free clinic for the poor. Imagine that. Her son broke his leg and she didn't want to pay the medical bills and bring him to the finest doctor to get this fixed right away. No, no, no. And she had the money. And she had more than the money. Like she had tons of it. Uh, they say accounts have her storming away after being recognized. Uh, her biographer Slacks, uh, Slack says that she paid her bill and took her son to other doctors. His leg did not heal properly. And after years of treatment, because she didn't initially take care of it the right way with her money, the leg of her son had to be amputated. Now that's just how far she took it down the, I love money, I love hoarding money, I love money more than my own son. I don't care much about his leg. I'm well, just gonna get it fixed the cheapest way possible. Now, the other person you see on your screen is R.J. Letourneau. He wrote a book called Mover of Mountains and Men. He was a Christian with a very, very deep faith and reverence for God. And I'm going to make it short for you guys. Uh, Letourneau was in the earth moving equipment. So he, he basically had uh, 300 patents in his company, our Letourneau uh, Earth Moving Equipments. So he built roads, he used his equipment to build roads and all that. And, and his equipment was very, very well known. And he provided the Allied forces with his industry uh, during the, uh, the war, the Second World War. And all this to say that Letourneau's fortune was very, very big. He had lots of money, but here's what Letourneau did that it was very, very unusual. As a man of God, Letourneau give, he gave 90 percent of his income to charities christian charities to building uh christian schools to all kinds of organizations and charities that honored god now that's the type of man that Letourneau said and he said i don't need more than 10 percent of what i make i live very comfortably on 10 percent and he made it his life goal to give 90 percent of his income to the works of expanding the kingdom of God. And if I'm not mistaken, when I read a little bit more of his biography, I think a young man by the name of Billy Graham once went to 
uh, one of his schools for a summer camp, if I, if I remember correctly. So the impact that Letourneau had uh, on the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is pretty impressive. Why? Because Letourneau understood that money is a tool in his hands, that God can bless abundantly if he doesn't love money, but keeps on loving God. Now we're going to get to the number two negative beliefs about money. Liz? Rich people don't go to heaven. Rich people don't go to heaven. And of course, this is not stated directly in the Bible. It's implied by Jesus, by something he said. But this has had a very detrimental effect for believers to think that rich people don't go to heaven. And I put that, that image there because that's oftentimes as a believer. And when I was growing up, my parents were very, very poor. And my dad hated the rich. He thought they were all like this man you see on your screen, uh, pricks. I'll just put it that way. But <laughs> pardon my French. But uh, so I had this mindset growing up that rich people were bad people, right? The rich people were going to hell. And if I was going to be going to heaven, I better not be rich, right? And Liz was lucky because she, she grew up in more upper middle class mindset. So she wasn't as corrupted with the, this the poverty mindset that we'll address later. And this rich people don't go to heaven mentality is based on what Jesus said to his apostles in Matthew 19, 24, to his disciples. You know, when the rich young ruler, the rich young man came to see Jesus and he said basically that he wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, go and sell all your goods and then come and follow me. Uh, and I'm boiling it down really fast here because we don't have time to go into that whole account because it's a very, very interesting account when you take the time to go in deep. Uh, there's things that Jesus said to that young man that, that are very interesting. But also uh, when it says that he loved him, Jesus loved him. I found that very interesting. But the point is, then when the young man came, went away, so, you know, didn't want to sell his stuff, he was discouraged, right? all saddened up, like, oh, I can't really do that. And he went away. Jesus turned to his disciples and says, Verily, verily, I send to you, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So is Jesus saying basically that Abraham didn't make it to heaven? Is he saying that Joseph didn't make it to heaven? Is he saying that Job didn't make it to heaven or David or Solomon, who were all very wealthy, by the way? Were they the lucky few? No, here's what I think we need to understand from this passage. And I think, and I'm going to try to boil it down fat quickly because it's just one of the points. I believe that whatever you come to know and love first is what you will have the harder time to abandon. So if in your life you do not know the Lord and by all kinds of ways you become wealthy and you pursue wealth and finances, and money, and you become very wealthy, chances are that you're going to love the money. You're going to love it for what it provides. And then when you have an encounter with God or you're presented with, hey, here's God, here's the plan of salvation, are you, are you willing to give your life to Christ? Problem is, you already have your own master. You already love money. So I think the opposite is also true. In the case of Abraham, in the case of Joseph, in the case of the patriarchs in the Old Testament, in the case of Job, these people loved God first. David, Solomon, these people loved God. Well, Solomon is a bit of a particular case, but let's talk about David, for example, all these guys. They loved God first. They loved God. David would have started out as a shepherd. He was by no means Mr. Wealthy. But because they loved God, and did the right thing, God prospered them as he promises in his word to do. If you love me and you abide by my commandments, you will prosper. That's, that's very biblical. It's in the Old Testament, in the New. It's, 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 a, it's a known fact. So these men loved God and they prospered. So I think whatever you come to know first, and that rich young ruler was, had come to know money first. And he says he was practicing religion, you know, obeying the commandments, but he was doing it in a religious way, like so many Christians today. I mean, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. So there's a lot of Christians in church today that are just doing it because their parents went to church before them for years. They brought them when they were young and they just keep going with the tradition. They have no idea what following God, being sold out to God and being sold out to the kingdom of heaven is all about. Okay. 
So what the Bible is actually, and what the Bible in Jesus is actually warning about when we read that verse that it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle is the hoarding, the accumulating of money and the hoarding of money, which comes from what? The love of money, right, Liz? Right. The love of money will make you pursue it, accumulate it, and hoard it. That's what the Bible warns about. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy if your priorities are in the right place. And I put the picture of um, Scro Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge there because it, we grew up, maybe, maybe you grew up like us watching DuckTales, and he was taking a bath every day in his money, plunging in money which was very, very nasty of it to show that to kids, right? <laughs> I mean, think about the mindset that's showing you, like, it's basically showing you the love of money. Look at Scrooge, he's our hero watching DuckTales and he loves money. Anyway, so, that, so it, uh, there's also the parable in uh, the New Testament where Jesus uh, well, is telling this parable of this rich man who is kind of getting bored with his money and he's like, what am I going to do with all I've got? I've got all this grain and all. Oh, I know. I know. I have all this. I'm a rich farmer. I got all this grain. I'm going to build new uh, storage facilities for my grain. And, and I'm going to store in those new storage facilities. And then I'm going to rest and tell myself, well done. Look at me. I'm awesome. And I'm paraphrasing here, by the way. But, and, and God said to him, you fool. This very night, your soul will be required of you. So in other words, what, what worth is it? What is it worth a man to acquire the whole world? if he loses his soul in the process. And here's some couple of verses about the hoarding of money and the accumulation of money. Ecclesiastes, uh, by the way, interestingly enough, Ecclesiastes was written by the richest man on earth, King Solomon. He said this, 5.13, Ecclesiastes 5.13, there is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches being hoarded by their owner to other people's hurt. No, to his hurt. That's, the, that's the, what it does to your soul. When you fall in love with money, it basically, it hurts you. It hurts you as a human being before God. Matthew 6, 19, the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust, rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Yeah, and so many people, so many Christians use this verse as justification for not trying to work towards um you know creating wealth because they're like oh well i'm not supposed to store it up anyway because they're so small-minded thinking oh i'm gonna hoard it exactly i have money it's impossible for me to give it away i would just hoard it so that you're seeing the evil nature of the human being that can't think bigger than himself and is constantly thinking well if i store it up you know uh, this makes me evil. They have no so, imagination. So basically. I won't go after it. I might as well just stay the way I am and just, you know, barely make it and just work for, you know, my, my daily bread and just making it by or, or barely making it. And therefore I'm being godly. Yeah. And, and there's something I want to add to that. Uh, there's a pastor I once heard. He was talking about finances and it was very insightful. Well, he's what he said about believers who say, uh, I don't want any more than my daily bread. I don't want any more than to pay my bills and to just barely make it. And you know what that pastor said? And it shocked me. He went like, how selfish can you get? You're so selfish. And the person's like, what? I'm not selfish. I'm humble. Look at me. I'm so humble. I, just, I don't want money. No, you're selfish. Because guess what? If you had money, how many people could you bless? How many people could you help? How many ministries could you start? How many ministries could you encourage? How many uh, orf uh, orphanages could you build? How many churches could you help finance? Think about that. Lack of imagination in the heart of a believer is, is fatal. It's fatal. How many people could you just bless by over tipping or by paying, uh, you know, a a widow's or an elderly person's grocery. Yeah, or just or giving away a, to, to a person charities. that you can see, you know, she's alone. You can tell by their, her grocery that she's, you know, just making it and she has kids to provide for. Like how many ways can you witness to people by blessing them with money to have more, an even stronger impact? Amen. The third negative, uh, popular, I should say, because there's a ton of negative beliefs about money, but I just took down, I think, five. Third one is Jesus 
was poor. And here's where I put an image I found. I thought it was kind of, we have an image of Jesus being very, very poor. Mm-hmm. Not, just, not just humble, you know, poor, like really broke. And uh, I think that's the wrong uh, way to see our, our Lord. So I'm going to give you five reasons why Jesus wasn't as poor as we're told. Now, here my, I chose my words carefully. I'm not teaching you that Jesus was rich. But I'm, I'm going to teach you that Jesus was not as poor as we are taught in religion. Okay. Number one, his disciples, some of whom had families, think about that lacked nothing and i think one of the best stories is the first time that when he met uh, when he had peter and the the other fishermen he he says uh, go out again and he went with them and they cast their nets and they had toiled all night they they were discouraged they were tired because to- when you toil all night it's tough and they were mending their nets when he came about they were like basically putting their stuff away he says, go out again. So they did that on faith. But think about it. There's an aspect of that miracle that we never think about. This miracle cash, how much money did it provide for Peter and James and John as fishermen to be able to leave their nets and to follow Christ afterwards? Because without that catch, here's the question. Would they have followed Christ? But he was the God of more than enough. He was the God who provided for them. He showed them, hey, I'm there for you. I got your back. Don't worry. If you follow me, you'll be taken care of and your families too. Number two, his adoptive dad, Joseph. It says in Matthew 13, 55, that he was the carpenter in Nazareth. So when Jesus was in Nazareth, all grown up, and he began teaching in the synagogue, and he spoke authoritatively, they were all like, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Joseph's son, uh, Joseph's boy? So the carpenter, he was the carpenter in Nazareth. So that gives you a pretty good idea of the business he was, he was doing. Joseph was probably middle class. And that's my, my view of my understanding of how Joseph made a living. He wasn't poor because he had a trade and having a trade back in biblical times made you middle class. Okay. He was a tradesman. So he was sought after for his services. So he was able to provide for his family. And then Jesus took over the business. He was a carpenter. So let's just assume that from that get-go, Jesus was about middle class. So we, com- we continue. Number three, when the Magi, 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 visited Jesus. Uh, and when you, do, when you do a little research, you realize that he was visited probably around when he was a, a year and a half to two years old. Okay, so he wasn't a little baby at that time. It was later. So when they visited and they gave, they brought frankincense and myrrh, but they also brought gold. And all of these things are very valuable. Now, you can only imagine that since the gifts were for Jesus, I would think that Mary and Joseph were probably at least took at least a part of it, if not all of it, and set it aside for when Jesus would be fully grown because the gifts were for the king of kings. They were for him. Yeah. Uh, Number four, he had a treasury during his ministry and women of means supported Jesus. That's in Luke chapter eight, verse three. Go check it out for yourselves. I didn't put all the verses here because, you know, it's one teaching. But so women of means supported him and he had a treasury. So in order to have a treasury, you have to be, you have to have some money coming in. And I know that we read in the scriptures that Jesus didn't have nowhere to lay his head and all that. And a lot of people identify this with, oh, Jesus was poor. He had nowhere to lay his hand. I think there's more to it than that. When you have nowhere to lay your head, it's basically, you're basically saying, I'm an itinerant preacher. I'm, I'm going from place to place to place to place. I don't have a place to call home. Okay. And that I think is what he was saying. He wasn't saying, hey, look, if you follow me, watch out. You're going to be broke because I'm broke. See, I used to read it like that when I was young. Mm. I thought, oh, Jesus is saying right there that he's broke. No, he's more like saying, look, I don't have a stable home. So if you follow me, it's going to be kind of hard because you're going to be moving from place to place. Number five, and that's just the final point to say, to tell you why Jesus wasn't as poor as we're told. The Roman soldiers, when he was hanging on that cross, they cast lots to obtain his tunic. 
and I wrote in parenthesis, would they do that for a rag? Now, in the Jesus movies that we're familiar with, Jesus is very poor, and he's wearing kind of like a ugly, you know, very simple clothing. And imagine if that had some blood on it or whatever. Would you start playing for it? Would you, would you be, go, you're a Roman soldier, you're, you have a wage, you have wages. Would you start telling the guys, hey, guys, I, I'll play you for it. I wouldn't do that for a rag. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't see what, what would be wrong with their heads if they did that for a rag. So it w must have been a piece of clothing that was actually worth something. And for it to be that, well, you can only imagine that maybe Jesus was more middle class than a poor, begging, itinerant uh, preacher. Now we get to uh, the point number four, the fourth negative uh, belief about money. Liz? Money is a curse. Some Christians go even as far as believing and teaching that money or wealth is a curse. And we saw that recently, uh, a, a well-known pastor, we won't say who he is, but he was basically yelling that um, on YouTube and saying that money was a curse. And I think there's nothing you know, more far from the truth because if you have this kind of mindset, then especially as a pastor you're just teaching people to stay in poverty and basically you know to always be dependent on the church for everything they need and not be being able to create wealth for themselves and we're going to see that later the, the verses that talk about that that god gave you the ability to create wealth so it just doesn't work and, and see that's taken kind of out of context where Paul is saying in the passage we saw uh, earlier in uh, Timothy where uh, he's saying um, that the root, uh, the money is the root, the love of money is the root of all evil. And in that whole passage where he talks about money, he does mention that money is a curse, but it needs to be kept in context. See, the love of money with a lot of wealth without knowing God, that's a curse. I totally agree. That's, and that's how you need to understand it. But there was this pastor, a very well-known well pastor. He was spitting and he was angry. Money is a curse. And he was spitting. I was like, this is insane. And I went to read the comments because I wanted to know what the other people, because it was a well-known video. There was a lot of uh, thousands of, of views on it. I wanted to know what people were thinking. And, uh, and a lot of believers were like, well, that's pretty crazy. Like, and even one, one wrote, and that made me laugh. He says, uh, pastors be like, money is a curse. Therefore, I'm going to pass the basket now. Give it to me. I will relieve you from that curse. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you can spin it in, in so many ways. Uh, uh, ask anybody who has no money if yeah. money, if he feels like getting cursed with money. Like yeah. ask anybody who can't afford food, can't afford uh, the rent, the rent's coming, they can't afford it, yeah. can't afford to send their kids to college. Ask them, hey, uh, would you mind if I cursed you with uh, $10,000? Let's see if they're going to say, yeah, no, no, don't curse me. Oh, no, I don't want that. That's, that's disgusting. It's money. Yeah. Some, no. some people are so religious that they're no earthly good and they're not going to do anything good, even if you did give them a million dollars because they just have the wrong mindset about money. And if you think like that, then unfortunately you won't do anything good with it because you're going to think that it's evil and you shouldn't have any. So you become an inactive Christian in the kingdom of God here on earth. Unfruitful too. Unfruitful, yeah. Yeah. So here's what I wrote, and you can tweet that, you can put it on Facebook. I think it's a great quote. <laughs> While the love of money is the root of all evil, I guarantee you that the fear of money which is also called chromatophobia. There's a name for it. Imagine that. It's so popular that this, there's a name for it. Is the root of no good whatsoever. <laughs> the fear of money, I think about that. I mean, if you think money is a curse, do you really think that money is going to flow to you, that God's going to give you money? No, God's going to be like, well, if, if in your agreement, in your mind, you think money is a curse, I'm not going to give you money. No. You're going to feel cursed. I don't want you to feel cursed. You know, there's a reason why we have the parable of talents in the Bible. And that's because God is showing us that he's going to bless and he's proud of the, the servant that is fruitful with exactly. what he has been given. Whatever he has been given, whether uh, uh, talents, actual talents, like being good at something or actual money. If you manage well, God doesn't send growth 
where there is poor management. Always think about it. And poor management begins in your mindset. What you think about wealth or finances, that's where your management of it starts. And we also, we're always taught in churches about uh, being good stewards, being good stewards. Well, see, most Christians think being a good steward is basically uh, cutting back. I'm going to cut on that bill. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the cheaper meat. I'm going to buy bologna. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to drive a Toyota even if I can afford more because I'm, I'm cutting back. A lot of Christians think that. But good stewardship is a lot more about being able to make the thing fruitful. In other words, taking what you're given and making it multiply, as in the parable of the talents, than about cutting back. And see, that's what we need to change. So now we're going to talk about the spirit of poverty. There is a spirit of poverty in the church. And we're going to, we're going to look at that because you need to, first of all, if you find out that, hey, you know what? I have a spirit of poverty. I need to get rid of it. And here's the thing. I had a spirit of poverty for the longest time. And it kept me, did it make me rich? Not at all. When you have a spirit of poverty, it is impossible for you to become rich. Think about that. Not even rich, well off, okay? I'm going to even go as far as saying that. A spirit of poverty will keep you from even becoming well off. Why? Because a spirit of poverty will make you think that money is a curse, that money is evil, that having money will make you wicked. It's going to make you like all the rich people that are bad. That's a spirit of poverty. So it can blind believers. So we're going to unmask the spirit of poverty. Liz, you're going to read the symptoms of the spirit. Because I've been talking and rambling. And, and my, my patient and lovely wife is just staying there. And I'm like, you know what? She needs to get into this because she knows as much as I do. So symptom number one, are you repelled by what you classify as materialism? Number two, are you in denial comforting yourself with words like everyone has debts, Others are experiencing the same thing. Well, it's just the way it is. Others are in the same boat. Symptom number three. Do you think that money matters are shameful to talk about, especially in church? Are you ashamed of talking about money? Are you ashamed of asking for a certain amount when you offer a service because you don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to ask for too much because you don't want to offend the other believer. You so you're kind of scared value. about, you yeah. know, making money. Do you come up with reasons why you are superior for having less or view poverty as a virtue or some kind of righteousness? And, and but don't change the paper. Symptom number four. We titled this teaching, Poverty is No Virtue. Mm -hmm. Because of the spirit of poverty. See, I grew up with that spirit of poverty. It was, it was entrenched in my heart and mind and upbringing, okay? And when you, when you grow up with that, you really come to view that rich people are evil and poor people are bad. And even Disney shows us that, right? I mean, yeah. even Disney shows us that the rich, the rich are always bad. Even Hollywood sometimes will show you the, the rich, wealthy, uh, abusive, evil, wicked um, CEOs yeah. or whatever. And it, it just blocks everything from happening, everything good from happening to you financially. Not all rich. And there, I have, I've met a ton of poor people, by the way, that are really evil, okay? That are wicked, that are bad, that have a bad mindset, that will uh, stab you in the back. I've, I've met a ton of poor people like that. So poverty is no virtue. Symptom number five, do you judge wealthy and successful people as money grubbers, rats, thieves? So do you have a, a negative mindset? Because in reality, you kind of wish that you had that wealth. So you kind of have to despise them because you don't have that wealth. If you don't you, share look, that. If you, if you reason it away, like saying, let's say you're broke, you reason it away, you look at, at people that are wealthy, making it, having uh, lots of material possessions or whatnot. It's easy to reason it away thinking, you know what? Uh, th this, this guy is just a rat. He's a money grubber. He's a thief. That's why he got rich. It's easy to do that, right? And it justifies your own situation by doing so. Sorry about that. I thought I shut it off. <laughs> it happens. So, do you think, do you make excuses about why others are doing better? They're good breaks, better education, know the right people. So, you know, oftentimes we felt like that. I know yeah. that, you know, when we were trying to, we were trying to make it and we're struggling and trying to figure this thing out. We're like, well, maybe it's just because they're more educated. They're smarter than we are. 
uh, you know, they had better parents than we did better that, kid, that yeah. you know, left them a business, uh, had a legacy to follow in and made th things easier for them. Like we find all kinds of excuses on, you know, why, um, you know, other people made it better than us. And, you know, we're just like these, uh, you know, we're just not the right kind of people or we're just not smart enough or just didn't have the right parents or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we find those excuses and the spirit of poverty kind of masks you thinking that so that, you know, it's like a blindfold so that you don't try to change your situation because you're in this acceptance mode that, well, it's just the fate that, that you were dealt with. So just deal with it and accept it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And symptom number seven, do you judge others as shallow if they think of, uh, learn about or act on financial matters. So, you know, some people that have the spirit of poverty will see other uh, members of the church making it financially and talking, and talking, talking openly about, about, you know, prosperity or, 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 or going to wealth seminars or, or um, talking think about financial how matters. How ungodly, without... how shallow of them to, you know, want to learn about money. Like what is there to learn about money? You know, and and that's something that, you know, we, God brought us to the realization. Basically, he taught us, you know, how to fish for ourselves. Instead of giving us fish, he taught us how to fish, fish for ourselves. Yeah. And we had to change our mindset about money and we had to change our way we were thinking about it. That was huge. And the way we saw others and uh, even God brought us, you know, on a path where we discovered a lot of other uh, entrepreneurs and Christians that were very wealthy and we saw how they were using their money to, to bless, to bless people. other people and kind of start seeing, okay, there's a, there's way more to this and we have to learn about wealth and we have to get educated. And it's not because we haven't been taught these things that it's too late. And it opened us up when we started meeting those wealthy believers who were really, really good people doing the, their best to help others. That's when you go like, Hmm. It's a whole new world, like something you never considered when you some have a poverty mindset. Yeah, and some of the the wealthiest Christians that we we've, we've met spend a lot of hours working really, really hard to have that financial wealth to bless other people. So you know, it's it's wrong for us to um, you know kind of have this wrong mindset to say that they're money grubbers or that it came easily to them because most of them have worked double the hours that you work in a, in a week. A yes. lot of them work 60 to 70 hours. Yeah, well, they they say, love, they love what they're doing, but they work a lot of hours, a lot more than what most people would do. They so, say that an entrepreneur is someone who works 60 to 80 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week for someone else. Uh, <laughs> symptom number eight, I really identify, I growing up, uh, what I struggled the most with was this uh, spiritually superior mentality that I had. And let's read it for the So do you think of yourself as being more spiritual or mature than those who want to succeed financially? Wow. What better way to justify being broke or poor than to think yourself more spiritually mature, advanced, or more like Jesus than this guy over there who's actually making 500,000 a year or a million a year. Wow, he, he really doesn't know God like I do. I know God, I'm a good person. Look at me, I only make, you know, put in the number you think is, is the number of being broke, but you know what I'm getting at. Now here's the thing that most believers do not hold on to and grab with both hands and believe. Your prosperity in all matters, delights your father. It delights God. Psalm 35, 27. Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And other versions say who delights in the prosperity of his servant. And I like the word delight. We have the, uh, the version of pleasure, has having pleasure in something. But when you delight in something, I delight in seeing my children succeed. I delight in looking at them be happy. And the same goes for God with us. Exactly. So we see this by this verse that is in the Bible in Psalm 35, 27, that he delights that there's pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And that's because his servant has the right mindset that is helping the kingdom He's of God serving prosper God properly. Exactly. Now, remember another scripture is very important for you to remember, remember in this uh, teaching, 
you have been given the power to get wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. And the, whole, the verse, when it's put in context, shows you basically like when you get to that level where you have wealth and you acquire fortune, he's basically warning, don't forget God because it all came from him. He gave you this ability to create wealth. Here's the thing. God didn't give you, and I wrote this at the bottom, God doesn't give us the power to get by. He gives us the power to get wealth, the power to get wealth, not to get by. Why? Because he wants to establish his covenant. Now, in the Old Testament, his covenant was a certain way. And in the New Testament, we're under the new covenant now. Covenant's uh, still under a different way now, but things that haven't changed, wealth in the hands of a child of God can go a long way, doing a lot of good for a lot of people. Amen. But unfortunately, but unfortunately, Ms. Bohem. So Christians often maximize their efforts to be more frugal instead of putting their efforts into being more fruitful. Isn't and I see truth? this all the time, all the time, especially, you know, a lot of women that are trying to make ends meet for their husbands, you know, their husbands work hard, the, the mom stays home. And she's trying to make ends meet. She's trying to be super, super frugal, uh, making her own bread, doing all kinds of things, you know, taking care of the kids, doing homeschooling. And all those things are great. But we have to see the bigger picture that even if those, some of those things are, are, are good and godly, we can't fall into the, the mindset of being so frugal that we're constantly cutting back to a point where it's, you know, even... Um, we're creating a spirit of lack all around us. Yeah. So many Christians are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. What it means basically is, you know, cutting. someday in heaven, I'll be rich right now. My lot is to be poor. Exactly. But and, and, you know, and just live on hand me downs and always cutting back on less. And, you know, sometimes we have to do that for a certain time, but we can't do it to the point where we're in this mindset of lack where we're constantly cutting back and telling our kids we can't have this and we can't have that. And you know, there's no money coming in and there's this and there's that. And we have to always cut back um, because those words are ungodly. God wants us to talk as if, you know, he's our father that is providing for our needs and, and abundance is coming. And you know, that was a big thing that we had to learn to speak to our children differently. Instead of saying, you know, no, you can't have that. Mommy and daddy don't have the money for that. Instead of saying that, we would say something like, you know, uh, we'll look into it eventually. Maybe, you know, we'll have the finances for that. Um, we're, you know, we have to be very or wise a, or with our money right time. now. Not, not at, at this time. time. Uh, eventually, you know, and, and we'll see what God does. You know, we'll see what God does. Good things are coming. Great things are coming towards us. And, you know, you never know when you know, we might surprise you and buy something like that, that you really want. And I like what you're saying with the scarcity mindset. Uh, scarcity mindset basically says, I can't, I can't, I can't. But an abundance mindset always asks, how can I? Mm -hmm. How can I? And that's the difference between being, and there's nothing wrong about being frugal, by the way. I, I don't think God wants to do overspend or to, to be crazy with your money. To be wise you with your money. You have to be wise with your money. Uh, but to be overly frugal, that, that can become a sin. And uh, so the, the difference is, instead of thinking, I can't, thinking how to become fruitful, how can I? Yeah. How can I? So right now I can't, but how can I? So you yeah. have to do that shift. And, and it was good when, what you said, it's written there. Many Christians are so heavenly minded that they're not earthly good. They're always thinking, well, in heaven, the roads are going to be paved with gold. And heaven is this and heaven is that. And someday in heaven, someday, someday in heaven. Uh, and yet uh, in, the, in the, the Lord's Prayer, we pray, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is where? Done in heaven. Oh, wow. And, and heaven, are, how are the roses? Made out of gold. Okay. So does that mean that maybe we should try to make more instead of cutting back more? Yeah. And we have to so have the right the mindset. We have to be thinking, you know, we are, we are um, working for God. We are his sons and daughters. He is a good heavenly father that wants good things for us good things for his children 
And so when we're operating in a spirit of lack, in a mindset of lack and teaching our kids to lack and to think always that they have to cut and cut and cut, we're not, we're not painting the picture for them that God is a God of provision, that God does provide for our needs and good things are coming and blessings are coming. And those children will grow up to operate in the spirit of lack of having either the same or less than what you had. Mm -hmm. And so they won't be thinking of how they can use their minds to create wealth and, and to bless other people and to create abundance in their lives for their children because they're going to be operating in the lack mentality. In the lack mentality. This is not God's will. In other words, for you to operate, always trying to cut back, living from a position of lack, uh, God wants us to think of him as a provider, a good God. He, uh, one pastor once said, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he's, El, uh, he's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. Yeah. And, and, and that's, it's funny, it's tongue in cheek, but it's still, our image of the Father needs to change for our money mindset to change. Yeah. So you need to break free from your negative money beliefs. We broke free, and it's still a work in progress, by the way. Sometimes I find myself still slipping back in that old mindset, and I have to take the thought, bring it captive to Christ. You have to break free, because that's what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to break us free from not only sin, of course, but everything that, that is a, a false view of God. And God is a God of abundance, and we know this to be true. So what do we mean by breaking free? Well, you need to break free by changing your beliefs, okay, and coming into alignment and agreeing with what God says. And what God says is this. So break free by believing that, number one, God wants you to grow and expand. He wants you to prosper as your soul prospers. Now, that think about that, the implication of that. So the more your soul prospers, we were talking earlier about um, God doesn't send growth where there is poor management. That's what it means. The more your soul prospers, the better equipped it is to manage more. So God gives you more. Number two, God wants you to be a good man or woman who leaves an inheritance to his grandkids. That's Proverbs 13, 22, which says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children and his children's children. Look, let's face it. Let's be honest here. Most of us have a hard time providing for just for our children. Huh? Many of us just can't even send our kids off to college. And yet the Bible says that a good man provides for even his grandkids, leaves an inheritance even to his grandkids. Exactly. Number three. And by the way, I'm not saying that you're a bad man here. I'm just saying, change your mindset from, from saying, okay, so how can I? In other words, if this is speaking to you, as it spoke to me back in the day, I felt like, oh, I'm by biblical definition, I'm not really a good man right now because I was, I was broke. And I was like, so, so what must I do? How can I become a good man? I needed to shift. Number three, God wants you to be the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy 28 teaches the, the, this. And it, there's the, 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 he says what he wants you to be. If you, if you obey his word, what he's going to give you. And God delights in your prosperity. Psalm 35, 27. Amen to that one. I love that verse. But unfortunately, Liz, most people doubt this. Most Christians don't believe it. They're, mm -hmm. they're doubting Thomases. So remember this. This is very, very important. Okay. This is the, we're getting to the crux of it here. For things to change, you've got to change. You're broke right now. You're suffering right now, possibly. Well, guess what? For things to change, you've got to change. Now, for you to change, you have to think thoughts you've never thought, do things you've never done. And ally yourself with people you've never teamed up with. That's how much change you need to change in order to change the things you can. <laughs> so here's the good news. We, me and Elizabeth, both, we want to help you prosper because we believe it is God's will for his people, for his children to prosper so that they can expand the kingdom here on earth right now amidst these difficult times and let's mention let's be honest here these are difficult times i mean we're filming this we're uh, we're recording this uh, what four months into covid now we're in july 2020 and things are rough things are have never been this rough in my lifetime yeah and, and unfortunately things will not be getting better financially probably as not. most people think so um it's really important now more than ever 
for the body of Christ to be uh, financially free, free of the government's grip, um, for believers to be able to create their own wealth and be independent, to be dependent, um, f- you know, independent and to, yeah, to enjoy the fruit of their hands for uh, you to be aligned and work with the Holy Spirit, with God to uh, provide finances for yourself and not be reliant on the gover- government's funds. And, and, it, and I think a lot of people have seen what that's done, right? A lot of people were so secure in their nine to five job until they, their job and their company was no longer existent. Like so many companies have folded, have gone out of business um, that you know were multi-million, multi multi-million dollar companies just fell to the ground because of a virus. So I think it's really important for us to wake up, to open our eyes, to see that God wants us to be financially free. And now more than ever, we have to apply these, uh, these bibli- principles that we're these principles teaching you that today. We're learning. So what is biblical prosperity? So so all this time we've been talking about money. So you you might be asking, well, Sebastian Elizabeth, are you telling me? That God wants me to be a millionaire? Well, look, I'm not saying he doesn't want you to be a millionaire. But I'm not saying he does want you to be a millionaire. That's case by case. Every man has his price. And what what do I mean by every man has his price? Well, it's very simple. Whichever amount will keep you aligned with the creator and not get you into the love of money, you you can have that. But whichever amount is that threshold where you're going to start shifting and start forgetting about God, right? Well, that's the amount you should have. (laughs) So you need to stay under that. Okay. So I don't know how much God wants you to have, but I do know that he wants you to be prosper, biblically speaking. So what is biblical prosperity? Well, we wrote it down a verse here from the living Bible, second Corinthians nine, eight, Liz, what does it say? God can give you all you need. He will give you more than enough. You will have everything you need for yourselves and you will have enough left over to give when there is a need. Amen and amen and amen. I, I love that rendition in the Living Bible of 2 Corinthians 9, 8. He's the God of more than enough. Mm-hmm. Next slide. So what does more than enough means? What does it mean? Well, here's what it means, okay? That's biblical prosperity right there. You can, you can take a screenshot of that. That is biblical prosperity right there. You having no financial debt. No debt. You having more than enough money to fulfill every kingdom assignment he has for you. So that means having more than enough money to fulfill every kingdom assignment. So is eating part of your kingdom assignment? Yes. Food? yes. Paying your bills? Yes. Yes. Uh, driving your car? Yes. Putting your kids in college if yes. they need to, if they want to go to college? Yes. Yeah. All these things, by the way, are part of your kingdom assignment. So there's your basic needs, but then there's more than that. So God wants to give you your basic needs for sure. And then some. So because, whatever he puts on your heart to yeah. accomplish for his kingdom, he will fund. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And that starts with the basics. So you need to have more than enough left over to help others fulfill their kingdom assignments. So any vision that God places on your heart, um, you know, you have to have your basic needs met and that of your family to go forward with, Uh, assignments and visions that God wants you to build things and put into place for the the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that there should be no poor among you. Mm -hmm. Yahweh says that our our living God, our father says there should be no poor among you. Why? Because I put everything in place through my laws, through my will, by giving you the ability to create wealth. All these things I put in place because I want you to prosper. You're my people. I love you. You're my children. I love you. And, uh, and that's the thing. I mean, a lot of people think, well, if I, if I just get my needs met, that's going to be enough. No. See, uh, for sure, God wants to meet your needs. That, that's for sure. But uh, the, the thing is, when your needs aren't met, you're not able to go the extra mile for the kingdom because you're too busy putting your, extending your energy, your time, your resources to try to acquire that next meal. And God, that's not God's will. See, that's when, when, when we resort to... Uh, thinking in the, the, the earth curse system or the beast system, and we do things like the pagans, Jesus said, uh, the pagans run after these things. They, they run after the, the, the next meal or the rent or their clothing. But it shouldn't be so with us. We should run after what? After the kingdom of God. That should be our priority. And so he wants you to have no debt, more than enough for you, and more than enough 
to help others who are trying to accomplish things for God. Think about this. Is that your situation right now? So the question some of you might have, so, okay, so now we're in a bad situation. COVID is, is crushing our economy. The government's made decisions that are crushing our lives. Uh, we, we feel stuck. How can we create wealth today? Well, basically the recipe really hasn't changed that much throughout, no matter if it's a good economy or bad economy, you're a child of God. And the recipe pretty much stays the same no matter what happens. Ecclesiastes 11.2, Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, he said this, invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. And how relevant is that verse right now to our situation right now? I would say like this, is, I feel like I'm reading today's newspaper. Like seriously, <laughs> the disaster that came upon the land all over the world is causing people to, to, to question how they're going to make it, yeah. right? And one thing that has stood the test of time from, all, from always is the ability to create multiple streams of income. And that's what Solomon's getting at there. He's saying have more than just your J-O-B or just over broke. He's saying you need to find ways to create multiple streams of income. So have more than just your job. Have other things going for yourself. That, that's one of the best ways. Now, and... Of these multiple streams of income, one of the best, best, bestest ways is, is, is creating residual income. So the kind of income that once you put things into place will keep on giving you extra income. So it doesn't have to stop you from doing what you're currently doing. Even if you do have a, a job, an employment that you do like, um, and that you studied for and you want to keep on doing, but it's just not cutting it. You just don't have that extra money to go on vacation or to provide for college or different things that your family needs. Then you have to find a multiple stream of income to accompany that so that you and, can. And re residual income pay those is things. one of the best ways because it's basically money while you sleep, right? Yeah. So if this is you, if you have more month at the end of your money, if you desire to leave an inheritance to your children's children, if you desire to bear more than just spiritual fruit, if you want to stop commuting and work from home, if you want to help more people, if you desire better things for yourself and your family, if you want more time freedom to spend on things that matter, then you're at the right place. And Absolutely. now we're not going to mention we're, we are not in a network marketing company in case some of you are wondering. Some of you might be thinking that, yeah. So here's what we do, okay? So we help people to, and we, we check mark these off, we help people to eliminate debt, including their mortgage. Because guess what? <laughs> and just a little parenthesis here for mortgages. Uh, for those of you who don't speak French, it's very interesting. The word mortgage is composed of two, uh, two words in French. Ma, which means debt, and uh, uh, gage, which, which, gage, which is a pledge. So a mortgage in the French, in the old French, is a pledge of death. Do you like your mortgage? Well, you're basically saying you like your pledge of death. And for a lot of people right now, with the recession and depression got, uh, being crushed upon them, uh, they're really feeling that this mortgage is a pledge of death. So uh, a lot of people we know uh, that, that, that do what we do have helped people eliminate their mortgage, which is a big deal. Uh, we help people develop a process that generates what we mentioned earlier, uh, residual income every month. We uh, help people implement a healthier lifestyle for themselves and their family. So uh, we help them build a legacy through a business model that has had a proven record so it's been proven it's been successful for over 30 years so it's nothing like a startup or something that just you know started that won't promise you anything it's really been uh, proven the test of time uh, we are both so here's what we provide by the way yeah. here's what we provide you so we are both certified Christian coaches and leadership trainers we provide faith leadership and personal growth content weekly that is second to none we provide you with the method, knowledge, coaching, and expertise to become your own boss and leave the nine to five. And we introduce you to a tried, tested, and true way of creating residual income for you and your family. 
So what we are looking for, we are looking for believers who care about changing their situation and believe it can be done. We are looking for people who are tired of just getting by and who want to get wealth. We are looking for motivated, hungry, and intentional people. Because if you're not intentional and you're not willing to to apply yourself, obviously it won't work. We are looking for kingdom leaders who believe in the God of more than enough. Yes. And so you- if in your heart you know that God wants you to have more than enough, you believe that he's a God that's good, that wants to give you these good promises that he says in his word and you want to see them come to pass, then you're at the right place. Like Les Brown once said, you've got to be hungry. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people who are hungry, tired and hungry. Okay. But we are not looking for people that want to get rich quick. So, which means we no. um, want This is not what we're about at all. <laughs> exactly. So it's not an overnight uh, thing that you're going to put into place where, um, you know, you're just going to, you know, click on a button and you're going to start making some money. It's not that kind it's of not, thing. No, it's not a get rich quick there, scheme. So there is a proven process and we're going to go through it with you. We're going to mentor you. We're going to help you um, every step of the, of the way, but it does Uh, require that you do work at it and you do apply yourself and you know all of this can be done um, part-time you don't have to you know put 40 hours in you can just put an hour or two a day into your business and this will provide results so if you're tired of so break the cycle yeah break the cycle we were in that cycle if you keep doing what you've always done you'll keep getting what you've always got how's that working for you like it wasn't working good for us. I can tell you that. I mean, it was really not until we got fed up until we went like, and when is enough enough? And maybe you're at that point today. And I'm hoping you are, if, if you were in this, if you're in a situation that was similar to ours, I hope you're at that point where you're like, you know what? I believe in the God of more than enough. And I believe that enough is enough with what I've been doing. And I believe there has to be a better way than this. And I want to try new things. So to have this, what we're showing you on the screen there, what is this? Well, basically, healthy, vibrant family, some free time to go golfing or enjoy life or, or, or doing trips. There's a nice view of a trip there. Or to have a healthy retirement with your loved one, to have a, a healthy spirituality combined with all that, to have this type of abundance, this type of blessed life, the, the life that we all aspire to, we all want this. I mean, this is all stuff that every, I don't know anybody who would look at these images and say, I don't want this. So you have to be willing to do this. So in other words, previous life, to have this, you have to be willing to do this. And what is this? Well, change. You have to stop relying on maybe someday I'll, or maybe someday I'll be lucky enough to, or maybe someday things will change. I, I met people like that. They thought things would magically change for them. And all of, a, all of a sudden, they wouldn't have to do the job they hate. And all of a sudden, they, the money would be coming in for some reason. Like, no, it's not going to happen unless yeah. you change. So, and you have to make that decision. So let's stop buying lottery tickets and take matters into our own hand because God gave you the ability and the brains and the know-how. Um, and we're here, we're here to help and coach you and continue the education of this. Absolutely. So step one, we are inviting you to join our free Facebook group, Top Kingdom Growth. Um, so I'm going to put a button below this uh, webinar, this masterclass, where you're, you're going to be able to click and join our masterclasses. So in this group, we offer weekly podcasts that, revol- that are all about kingdom uh, leadership and topics that believers go through Uh, in life, different things that are going to help strengthen you in your faith. Um, We have free kingdom masterclasses that will help you accelerate into your purpose, provision, and God-given assignment. Mm -hmm. So we we talk a lot about purpose, um, free eBooks and resources, and life coaching videos. So we're going to have all these resources. It's all free. We're not charging for a group. Uh, We really want to continue the education because obviously we can't tell you everything we've learned in one webinar and one masterclass. Uh, There's different things that you can learn and you know, that will change your mindset and that will really help you grow. And so we encourage you to click on that button and join. That's number one. We're inviting you to to that, to the group. Yeah. And step number two, 
Step so, number two. Step yeah. number two, we're inviting you to partner with us um, and we'll help you build your online business. Exactly. So we're offering a simple proven system that creates results. Anybody who applies themselves will get results. We are here to mentor and coach you every step of the process so that you can live a debt free life and prosper. Amen. And we will be offering exclusive kingdom teachings pertaining to wealth creation, developing an abundance mindset, kingdom leadership, and personal growth to those that partner with us. Yeah. So basically we chose a vehicle um, that, you know, we decide to use because you know, we could, you know, go step by step in coaching you into something, a venture that you want to do, but there's more risks and, you know, not everybody has the resources that they need to start off their own business mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah. Startups so, are hard. Yeah. Startups are hard. So what we decided is we chose a vehicle, a company that has uh, existed for over 30 years. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a company that we believe uh, offers so much to uh, the people that are working for them. They really have the right mindset, uh, the right heart, and the right really, resources too. The right resources and really have been growing through this time of virus and this COVID. Is they have been prospering. They have been growing. Imagine so, that they have been prospering. Pro like it's been the company that they didn't have losses. They have major, major. Uh, uh, growth in the last what yeah. four, five, six months. Exactly, because Incredibly. they offer they offer uh, products and things that people need, that people are using, uh, and products that are you know that we're always going to need. Destroying this virus, and you know it's not just about the products; it's about the mindset behind the company and how their leadership is second to none, and how they are helping people at any stage of income, you know, being able to yeah. get rid of their debts, uh, pay off their car loans, all kinds of things. And everybody is recognized. Everybody in the company is recognized. And so we really love this vehicle that we're using. And so if, you know, you've been saying, you know, I've always wanted to do a certain thing. Uh, you know, maybe you have an idea of what the vision that God wants you to do. Um, but all, all of that takes money. You know, there's a lot of things that we want to do for thriving on purpose, but we understand that we need a vehicle that um, is going to multiply that wealth faster. So we decide residual income, to create residual income so that we can use those, uh, those amounts to fruit, you know, to fruitify, to, what's the word, um, to multiply <laughs> what we want to do for God's kingdom. So, I know a lot of you believers are at that place where you you have something that God put on your heart, but you don't have the money to do it. And maybe some of you, you know, you don't have that idea yet. You've been so struggling on the hamster wheel to try to provide and do, you know, just like working like in a tunnel, like just looking at where, when is this going to ever end? Mm -hmm. I just working, working, and I feel like I'm going to work to my death kind of thing. And you, you can't even begin to think about applying a vision and doing something else because you're just you're trying just a survival to mode right survive now. and survive. So if that's you, that's, this vehicle is perfect, you know, to start off somewhere yes. where you can say, okay, I'm, I'm applying the steps that Elizabeth and Sebastian are coaching me to do. And I'm creating wealth uh, one step at a time one step at a time until you get to that place where finally you can breathe, yeah. pay off to your debts and then see where God leads that, where God says, you know, okay, with this money, I would like you to do this or create this, or, you know, you'll, you'll decide what God wants you to do. But all of this is possible um, through the, through this option that we're offering. And, and here's what I want to say, like we're in tough times. We understand that some of you lost their businesses. Some of you lost their, your jobs and you're struggling right now. And we can really sympathize with you. Uh, for some of you, uh, 200 bucks a month would make a huge difference. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's very achievable, very easily achievable with what we're offering. For some of you, you're, you're a little more ambitious and you want maybe 2,000 or 4,000, 5,000 a month. And for some of you, 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 want, you want to go all the way. You're like, you know what? I, I want to I turn a new leaf and I want to leave behind. I lost my job, but I hate it in any way. And I, I want to do something completely different. And, and you might find this will be a perfect fit for you. Uh, so yeah, that's all I want to say. Yeah. So I, you know, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, how much is this going to cost me, right? This must be so expensive to start or whatnot. And no, it isn't. It's so reasonable. 
Um, it's really, and that's the reason why we picked, we picked this vehicle because, you know, we were where you're at. We have three young we, children we we and we don't want to be spending money on anything that doesn't make sense. That doesn't help, uh, you know, help our family in any shape or form. We're not into, you know, uh, fancy juices and, you know, overpriced vitamins and things that, vitamins, that yeah. are overpriced hair care products and stuff like that to, uh, you know, ruin your budget. We're not at all about that. So what I encourage you to do, you're going to see a button below um, where you can just click on, you're going to land on our chat on our Thriving on Purpose chat. And I'd love for you to just say hello and say, look, I saw your webinar. I saw your masterclass on poverty is no poverty virtue. Is no virtue yeah. And I'm willing to know more on how I can get started. And um, I'll have a chit chat with you and get to know you a little bit and um, see how I can best serve you and um, and present to you, you know, what the vehicle we're talking about is and you'll decide you'll if decide for yourself if it's for you or if it's not for you that's fine but at least we're giving you the option to completely change your life and we're there to mentor you absolutely um, we're there for you every step of the way and you know by joining uh by partnering with us you're going to get so many great teachings where we're going to keep on pouring into you and teach absolutely. you about um how to create wealth and the money mindset that we need to have and and so many great kingdom teachings that God has put on our hearts that we've been teaching through our podcast and that we're going to be really uh, diving in in um, our team. And, and this journey we've been on, like you saw our whole journey, we shared it with you. The whole point of this was for, for us to get to that point where we, we can now pour into you, help you uh, accelerate. See, we, we had to learn the hard way. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, we didn't tell you our whole entrepreneurial journey, but Liz had at we some tried point, many different things. Liz, at some <laughs> point she had a business, a coastal beach decor business. She was trying to sell furniture online. I mean, we tried a ton of things. And, uh, so the point to all this is that we found this vehicle. We want to share this with you because we, it may or may not be free, but we want to share with you at least to, to have a look, to consider it. Because we believe that this is a really, really good, and solid vehicle. A lot of people, uh, they, they want to drive something that's reliable. I'm one of those. I, I mean, I'm a minivan kind of guy. I like, I like Toyotas. They're reliable. They're going to start. They're, they're going to get you where you want to go. And I know they're not going to break down. So and for, also, for, some, for some people, that's really uh, encouraging to know it when, you're with, with, uh, when you partner with, with something that's safe, something that's reliable. Yeah, and I know for a lot of you, um, you know, maybe this smells to you like a network marketing company, and that's why we mentioned it wasn't because yeah. um, I know that a lot of network marketing companies, unfortunately, will you know have overpriced products or have unrealistic expectations. Not not all are like this, but a lot are, and so uh, the company that we chose to partner with has very realistic expectations and rewards. Uh, their, um, their representatives very, very well. And it's a very simple process. It's nothing that's a rocket science. Anybody can do it. Can Any stay-at-home mom can do it. Anybody that has a very limited education can hey, do it. Hey, I, I'm a postal worker. I can do it. She, she, she was. Yeah, you I was. I was. I was a postal worker. But the point is, uh, wherever you're at in life, you can, you can do this. Exactly. So we hope that this webinar has opened your eyes, that it has blessed you and we hope to hear from you. Absolutely. So just click on the button below and we'll have a, a fun chat. It won't last long. I won't take all of your time. We'll just chit chat and we'll see how we can best help you. So be blessed and thrive on, thrive on friends. Thank you so much for spending this hour and a half with us. God bless you.